Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I am Tapan Doshi, and on behalf of IBPC, I welcome you to an exciting webinar on supply chain digitization. The last couple of months have presented unprecedented challenges to businesses across the world. As senior leaders within our own companies, we have faced these challenges and dealt with the repercussions firsthand and will probably continue to do so in the near future. Today is an opportunity for us to understand how some companies were able to better manage the impact of COVID-19 and what we can learn from them. Our speakers today will not present cliches or platitudes, but live case studies of real companies who have seen a tangible positive impact to their businesses while facing the same challenges that all of us face. This session will be practical, it will be factual, and most importantly, it will be actionable. Our webinar today will have one presentation by two speakers, followed by a Q&A session with both the speakers. As the moderator, I will try my best to accommodate as many audience questions as possible, but it may be difficult given that we have so many attendees. Before I introduce the speakers, a couple of important points. Please post your questions via the Q&A tab in Zoom, and please mention whether your question is directed at a particular speaker or both of them. The second point is that the webinar is being recorded and will be shared via the IBPC YouTube channel. And the presentation deck will also be shared in the IBPC monthly newsletter. Rest assured that all the event attendees and IBPC members will have access to all the event resources. With that, let me introduce our expert speakers for today. Mr. Vijay Krishnan is Director of Business Transformation with MCA management consultants in Dubai. Mr. Vijay has 25 plus years of experience in general management, CFO, and consulting roles on different projects with Nestle, PwC, PepsiCo, Fonterra, and Heinz across GCC, Central Asia, India, Oceania, and Africa. His talk will focus on how the customer is at the heart of the change that is happening due to digitization. Welcome, sir. Mr. Rahul Dogar is our second speaker. Mr. Rahul is the CEO of Holisol Logistics based out of India. Mr. Rahul has 22 plus years of experience in supply chain, business strategy, and currently spearheads technology strategy in a team of 300 plus supply chain professionals with, at Holisol. He has held leadership positions with IKEA, Agility, and worked in Indian subcontinent, GCC, and Europe. His talk will focus on the process of supply chain digitization. Welcome, sir. Thank you very much, Tapal. Thanks, look forward. Both the speakers are highly experienced leaders who have witnessed firsthand the changes and the challenges of COVID-19. Both have actively enabled positive business impact across geographies in these unprecedented times. Gentlemen, we look forward to spending an insightful hour with you and thank you for your presence with us. Mr. Vijay, over to you to begin the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Tapan, for your warm welcome and indeed a very, very crisp introduction. The objective for me now is to interact with this August audience and try to share our experiences, which are real experiences over the last 60 days, and probably bring out a few stories which might resonate. It's indeed a pleasure to interact with this audience in this IBPC webinar today. Now, supply chain digitalization is a vast and a deep topic. What is COVID-19 doing to this? It is just ensuring that it becomes more topical. 
we have been hearing a lot on supply chain digitization at least for the last three years and a lot of action also. The first 10 to 12 minutes, what I am going to do is just try to give you some business context and a few examples so that the rest of the slides, you can draw linkages to some of these real life business examples. So let's take what's happening to the large brick and mortar giants. Bindawood is a huge retailer out of KSA. Again, a brick and mortar focused company, but their online portal over the last 45 days is witnessing growths of 200% over previous averages. Carrefour again is a very, very large giant here, much larger regional footprint in GCC. Again, big numbers. These numbers are directional but you can see the kind of spikes which people are witnessing in their online activity. And come to a pro company like Mums World, which is an online specialist, they are recording 800% growth. So what does this say to us? Order values grew by 50%, app installations grew 400%, things like grocery and pharmacy, these grow in the range of 300 to 500%. I, I, I was doubting whether these numbers can be true, but if I look at the number of webinars which I have participated and attended, they have grown 1000%. So there is something which is happening more in the online space. So this is something which came as jokes on our WhatsApp, but I can clearly relate to this. 2015, I was a general manager in an FMCG multinational managing my strategic planning session. And it seems I was the blue person in that room because the ways I allocated the budget didn't seem to believe that digitalization will happen at such a fast pace. So it's a real resonance for me that this cartoon is so, so compelling and this whole session in 2025, if we were supposed to have a discussion in hindsight, probably COVID-19 would have acted as a catalyst. Digitalization has been happening for the last four to five years, at least in a big pace, but the pace is going to get a significant fillip. That's what we believe. That's what we seem to be headed to. When people get used to, to this kind of lockdown and the kind of new life which we're entering, I think there'll be new habits which people will start forming. As Mr. Tapan mentioned, my key focus is going to be on customer centricity. The reason for this, I'll try to bring it up in a couple of examples. We are seeing a lot of companies getting into digital transformation for sure. But the ones who are able to monetize these investments seem to be having a pattern. And when we see the pattern, it seems that they are putting customer at the heart of it all. As a result, the monetizability of the digital investments is growing at a much rapid pace. On the left-hand side, we have the ways of working which we are all used to. And this is where product excellence driven companies have built mega brands and rightfully so, and they continue to grow. There is no doubt about it. A product view is more like an inside out, whereas a customer lens is more like an outside in. As a result, we are seeing customer centric companies. They are having an ability to manage a lot more unstructured data. So product companies, market share, profit share, sales focus, a lot of traditional media, a transactional relationship at a supermarket and fantastic R&D capabilities, which sort of bring in the innovation. Whereas we got used to now newer KPIs. And what are these newer KPIs got to do with? 
they talk about cost of acquiring a customer they talk about long term value of a customer they are looking at customer excellence basically a customer experience is what is getting created in the digital transformation it's more likely to manage the product side of it in a let us say a far more superior manner initially because a lot of our erps systems processes people are things which we can digitalize faster where some of the larger companies are still struggling is to compete with the nimble and agile organizations which seem to have got the customer dimension so so very right yeah so this a uh, slide will be very very useful when rahul talks about the processes in a few slides from now so digital transformation we believe is about the customer at the heart of it certainly product is going to play a huge part but it will be a solution mindset it will be solutions features benefits that is what customers are looking for these days and we have a new millennial consumer who is digitally very very active probably digitally more comfortable than many of the people who have grown up building product companies that's where this transformation journey is having some nice uh, frictions go to the previous slide what what makes the key difference is data and this is going to be very interesting and it's something which all of us can relate to the ability to capture and mine data and convert it into insights is what is going to make sure that our revenue growth is going to be faster than the competitors example if we were to say that we have booked the ticket let's say personally i have booked a ticket from dubai to moscow in january and it's an online booking very soon the digitally active cust suppliers and digitally active brands would be reaching out to me to make sure that i am getting my jackets i am getting the right kind of shoes i am getting the right kind of equipment to travel to moscow to take care of the weather and temperature and to be comfortable in moscow now this data at the right time converted into an insight is something which we can see digitally native companies doing very well whereas the excellent brands the fantastic product companies who might have even superior leather jackets and much better quality shoes if they are digitally not there this is a lost sale for them so the customer data is in three distinct categories volunteered data is what you know our social media profiles and the kind of football teams and the musics we download is sort of there and there is observed data which people are able to use companies are able to arrive at the socio economic status and there is inferred data combining these three data we can see significant targeted marketing happening and the path to purchase now is far far more diverse than what it was 3 years back and as a result newer companies are getting more innovative to catch the customer ahead of an established brand now we just go to couple of examples what's happening because of all this digital maturity we can see concepts like cloud kitchen coming up not only are they coming up they have scaled up so what's happening a cloud kitchen is an emerging business model we have a gentleman with a kitopi t-shirt here many people in uae will uh, uh, probably know kitopi so fastest growing cloud kitchen and what have they done without a single physical store they have leveraged database and insights flexibility and variety of offerings 
and PNDL and balance sheet advantages in terms of an optimized capex, a lower overhead to deliver value. Now these emerging models are certainly set to grow. They start from the customer. They are an outside in driven company. Their ability to mine data is very good. And the more their target audiences live a digital lifestyle, digital lifestyle millennial consumers are more likely to be the reason why newer business models will evolve. One more example, this is called direct to consumer. Direct to consumer is now creating disruption in almost every significant CPG sector, which is consumer product group sector, whether it is eyewear or a beauty or a grooming, baby wipes, pet care, personal care, baby care, mattress. These are all companies which have been growing in the last three to four years. Amazing growth when you will see these companies and their customer centricity. What happens is they know the customer much, much deeper than the larger players. As a result, the content which they have digitally to entice their customers is very high. And so this has led to something called hyper-personalization. So customers really get pampered by organizations who are curating product and content to make sure that the customer feels really, really valued. This customer experience is going to an altogether new height. And this is mostly virtual. So D2C is where businesses sell directly to their customers or consumers and would mostly avoid any independent retailer or wholesaler. Once D2C businesses sort of grow, they then get into the next step of then looking at offline partnerships and offline infrastructure. And this is a much lower cost of failure model. And even during the early stages, they are able to gather significant insights about their customers. Now the topic is every challenge will come with a seed of opportunity. This is absolutely sure. And that's, that's where businessmen are made of different metal. In every challenge, they will certainly find an opportunity. What we are seeing is digitalization. Those who have adopted three to four years back and they're still evolving digitally, they seem to be better replaced. They seem to be capitalizing on this opportunity. They seem to be faster off the block. So you cannot give an official verdict, but they seem to be faster off the block for sure. One example to drive home this point, and this probably can be a very unique example. And we all know that showrooms closed here for almost 30 days. A medium sized furniture retailer saw a huge spike in demand for WFH furniture work from home. And I can relate to it because the chair which I was using in the home for two hours or three hours, if I need to use it for 15 hours, certainly there were people on the web searching for compact, comfort, cost effective. And these chairs and tables, two or three SKUs reflected 400% growth over this 30, 30 day dimension in online. This business was essentially an offline business. 80 to 85% of the sales were happening only in showrooms. But digital presence and connect to the database ensured that the data could be mined at a significant speed, which otherwise is impossible. So not only are we seeing work from home furniture, People are not able to go to the walk cinema. People are not able to have the entertainment outside. 
So what did his supplier give him as an insight? The insight came from Southeast Asia, where they say that gaming chairs are a big hit. And this trend was capitalized on and 700% growth on gaming chairs. So you can clearly see that agility, which is possible with a digital presence, can really give amazing growth potentials, newer business model options. All that was used is significant digital analytics, marketplace partnerships. They were able to tap into the reseller inventory so the resellers who were stocking, their inventory was also visible and they sold off even the resellers inventory. Collaboration with suppliers at altogether a different level when you are digitally there as a mature organization. And of course, a last mile delivery capability, which you will see more and more coming in the next few slides from Rahul. So this was my context setting and I'll be handing over to Rahul for the next. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, my, is it visible? No. I, okay. Okay. Thank you. I think, uh, thank you, Vijay. I think uh, wonderful insights on new business models uh, that are emerging. I'll uh, go with the example of uh, a huge uh, <clears throat> FMCG giant in India, uh, many of you would know them, ITC uh, group of companies, it's a conglomerate. FMCG happens to be one of their biggest uh, businesses. So, you know, this, this uh, FMCG giant, uh, of course, is highly digitalized at their back end, you know, their manufacturing, their distribution, etc. is all, uh, all on the technology, highly digitalized. But they were selling through the traditional uh, channels, uh, through the supermarkets, through the hypermarkets, through the neighborhood uh, grocery shops. Uh, you, you would find their products even in the pharmacy uh, uh, shops. Uh, so when this challenge hit them, all those channels uh, suddenly meant that they would have no sales. So this giant quickly moved on and set up their web shop. You know, they quickly moved on uh, to, set, to create what, uh, what is called itcstore.in. But the challenge that they faced is that because they never interacted with the end consumer, they did not have that data in place. Okay. That's where it quickly moved and leveraged and created and leveraged partnerships with some of the companies who were sitting on the lot of consumer data. The companies like Zomato, Dunzo, Domino, Swiggy, who who actually were directly delivering to the customers who were taking orders directly from the customers, not for FMCG category, but yeah, for other products. What it did do is that it created a beautiful win-win uh, relationship among these, uh, among, uh, among these partners uh, to harness on one hand, the consumer data that was brought in by these partnerships and the supply chain distribution data brought in by ITC to make it a huge success. ITC we hear is uh, doing extremely well uh, when it comes to uh, selling their FMCG products. Of course, now the offline has also started opening. Uh, but yes, this was a huge chapter or huge shift in their, in their overall strategy and they swiftly adopted to it beautifully. Uh, the next example, sorry, my, which, uh, okay. So next example that I want to share is from uh, fashion lifestyle industry, a very uh, famous uh, brand in India. Again, uh, you know, a uh, lot of fashion, uh, fashion cautious and loyal customer base. Uh, this company said, what is selling online as an offline. They have their own uh, exclusive brand outlets, multi-brand outlets. Uh, they sell on Amazon, uh, Mintra and few other uh, portals, online portals, uh, through their own web shop as well. You know, when the COVID hit, everything suddenly stopped. <clears throat> uh, the government did not allow the supply of non-essentials, uh, as you all know. And uh, suddenly this, uh, this company saw their revenue uh, going down to zero. 
and that's when they quickly pivoted what they beautifully did was that they st- they came out with their own range of fashion masks they created these masks for several price categories and quickly started selling them online and how they were able to do it is because they had the raw material and procurement relationships with their suppliers who were making garments earlier for them they quickly moved on to get those capacities to make masks for them married with the consumer data that they already had you know they fashion conscious customers and started selling those masks to all those customers online uh, and, and and you know managed to recover a lot of revenue what what it beautifully did for them you know strategically uh, look at the thinking look at the depth in thinking it it just did not bring them back into the market with some revenues but what it is also doing for them beautifully is that they will retain the loyal customer base they will they maintaining their presence in the market and and you know the thought being that once uh, even after the covid is uh, gone or lockdown is lifted uh the people will not move on to buy the high, high value uh, products immediately because the incomes have gone down so strategically what they trying to do is to bridge that gap they through the through the sale of masks which are low price items and are necessary they will still continue to have some interaction with those uh, fashion conscious customers and once those con- customers see an uptick in their income they would be able to win them back and maybe many more other customers the beautiful strategy that they have come out with uh, very very deeply thought uh, and and letting them retain the customer base as well as uh, make money over it, it the mass that they're selling at uh, are the are at the price points which are giving them a lot of margin maybe 100 to 100% margin in that sense and then they managed to do it uh, you know in in a short period of uh, only about 30 days uh then we have uh, an example of uh, this online travel porter and aggregator where you could uh, go and uh, you know make the hotel bookings train bookings flight bookings etc etc uh with the covid there you know their business suddenly went down there was zero bookings then nobody traveling then no hotel bookings etc etc uh, when they looked at what they had as a data as a relationships <clears throat> they quickly realized that you know the hotels that they have excellent relationship also have gourmet restaurants where people used to come for special dining events you know or fine dining they quickly decided to leverage those relationships and started putting the food menu of these gourmet hotels online you know so trying to sort of create a win win situation for the hotels who went out of the business and for themselves so they 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 created these gourmet menus for special home delivery you know so leveraging on whatever they had as a data uh many more examples uh, you know we also saw that a lot of uh, our omni channel customers who were selling online and offline uh and and uh, because of covid uh, was sitting on uh, was sitting on huge piled up inventories uh, in in the warehouses and distribution centers have quickly just with the change of a switch diverted all their inventories online you know and we seeing a huge spike in online sales in the last 2 3 days ever since the lockdown has eased out and the government has allowed uh the sale of non essential items also you know so beauty also is that online channels also were seeing a lot of pent up demand uh, they were taking orders they were they were doing the pre bookings but yes were not able to deliver because of the lockdown suddenly after the lockdown is over and a non essential delivery is allowed uh you know it's it's almost like the floodgates have opened uh, for a lot of these companies Uh, what we also saw is that companies who were only online have been able to quickly get back into the normalized operation after the lockdown was lifted vis-a-vis their offline players who have had a preparation time they had to go to the shops they had to make sure that shops are nice and clean and most important and most critical was that they had to pull the customers in into the shops whereas the online channels already had these customers coming in i mean nobody wants to go out and 
and and buy a product offline these days. Uh, you know, they, they they're happy uh, sitting at home, ordering online, getting product delivered delivered at home, and that's what a lot of these online uh, shops have been able to do. What we also saw that the the uh, supermarkets, hypermarkets, who were already digit had di digitalized uh, backends, quickly went about and set up their own web shops. From where they started taking orders, their uh, stores started acting like distribution and fulfillment centers, and then they started fulfilling orders uh, within a close vicinity of five to ten kilometers. You know, and that was only possible because they had all digitalized backend. A lot of distributors and wholesalers uh, they have uh, who had digitalized uh, presence quickly moved on and started taking orders online, uh, which was being done offline earlier. Food ordering pl platforms who were purely ordering uh, into the uh, purely into the taking orders uh, online and and delivering went ahead and tied up with the grocery chains. Went ahead and tied up with local uh, grocery shops and uh, onboarded these shops and started delivering groceries and they were able to do it only because they had exact knowledge of what uh, where the customer is and how much can they deliver and so there are numerous examples all over the world where you know people have uh, been pushed by the covid uh, to go online to change their business models and and leverage the situation so you know these are all sort of positive examples uh, that have come out uh, in the COVID. But let's try to look at what is the common thread when we talk about all these examples. And that is digitalization. You know, all these companies were able to quickly move on and do all the things because they already had some level of digitalization within the organization. And then, you know, they, they could look at that data and tie in the rest of it to make sure that whatever they're creating new becomes even more successful. What does, uh, but, but, but let's say, what does digitalization uh, mean for us? Uh, you know, a lot of times we just think that setting up a web shop or, you know, putting up your products on Amazon or Noon or Flipkart means that, okay, now we have a digital presence. Uh, I, I think that's a, that's an assumption that we need to all throw out of the window. Digitalization means that your whole organization has to have a digital presence. It has to have a uh, digitally ready data available for you to uh, take a look at. Uh, it can be it can be financial. I, I would say that uh, finance as a function has been uh, more progressive in that sense. Uh, the companies have invested in digitalizing finance by investing in uh, ERPs and other other accounting softwares. Uh, then, you know, uh, HR needs to be digitalized, the uh, marketing needs to be digitalized. Uh, but since uh, our topic here and, and especially mine, my thing is supply chain. So I would uh, talk deeply about uh, what supply chain digitalization means. And this is this is what uh, this slide says that uh, when we talk about digitalization, it just doesn't mean that you set up a nice uh, web store or web shop, which can be done in few dollars. Or, or uh, list your products on Amazon or Sook or uh, Noon or Flipkart or any other uh, online portal that is there. But what it also means that you will be able to become successful through these online channels only if you have digital supply chain to support it. You know, if So all the physical components of the supply chain, unless they have a digital layer, which is then capable of capturing the data and throwing it out for the analytics to come out with what is that data intelligently telling us? What is it that we need to do using that data? And how do we, what actions do we need to take within our supply chain? Unless we are able to do all that, uh, you know, having a web shop or uh, just creating an online presence will not really serve the purpose, will not really help us uh, to, to Forget about COVID-like situation, but even going forward. Uh, <clears throat> let's look at it a little deeply. What exactly can it do for us? Uh, and, and what do we mean by uh, having a digital supply chain? Uh, see, that there's a, there, is a, there is a system that can be used over each component of supply chain 
which can capture the data and that data can be harnessed uh, to create intelligent outputs and uh, which can which can really help the companies become successful uh if i if i let's say go back to the examples uh, that we discussed uh, let's say wildcraft example the company which uh, quickly pivoted and uh, created uh, those fashion masks the reason why it was able to do it is because uh, they they had excellent erp working at their suppliers they exactly knew what raw material how much raw material is available at each of their sourcing partners uh because you know you can't make mass from each of a, a, just any kind of raw material so they needed to know exactly how much is available at each of the factories they knew what is the capacity of each factory because they they just didn't want to go out and uh, you know start marketing that they're selling mass unless they had secured the supply okay so all that data available to them uh, on the screens help them to take a decision as to how much would they be able to produce and how and the demand side data the consumer data help them to decide as to how do they marry those that supply with the demand that will be out there in the market because they didn't want to have an 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 unhappy customer the fact also remaining that their consumer data told them that how much demand would come from each uh, let's say of the country and whether they can make sure that the supply would be available in that part of the country because you know the country was seeing uh, lockdown and the things were uh, very volatile and changing on a uh, daily basis so you know those are the things that they married and before they launched uh, launched uh, the, these masks very successfully uh, now uh, is is simply because they had this data available at their fingertips and which helped them to sort of create the the, the marketing uh, as well as the sales and the production plan uh, likewise you know when we talk about uh, we talked about itc uh, itc also have excellent uh, erps working at their manufacturing units uh, since the manufacturing units also took a big hit and when when they even opened up there were challenges uh, with respect to as to at what capacity would they be able to operate you know because people were not showing up for work uh, you know a lot of you must be uh, reading in paper that a lot of migrant population has moved back to their homes uh, so you know the fact even the factories are operating at 20 to 30% uh, capacity and even government has only allowed those many people to work you know that obviously reduces the capacity of what you can make uh, so they they had this data coming in real time uh, uh, from from their factories they had excellent distribution uh, management system and the warehouse management system which told them as to what is the inventory that is lying in the pipeline which is closer to the market so when they went online they could easily put that much inventory for online sales just to make sure that they didn't have dissatisfied customers so the stock that was exhibited on the online channels exactly married with what they had in the pipeline and what they could produce in the future so that the customers uh, are not left disappointed and they could do it only because this data was readily and real time available for to them you know, so you know lo looking at some of these examples i mean the food aggregator companies if we talk about how they went ahead and uh, instead of just selling uh, the food uh, that was being made in the restaurants or the cloud kitchens uh, when they onboarded the grocery shops they exactly knew what is their delivery capacity you know they had done analytics to a level where they know that okay a particular biker or a van can deliver so much of stuff can do so many deliveries in x number of hours so that delivery capacity analysis uh, is is something which becomes critical in those times and that's how they were able to schedule their grocery deliveries deliveries they were able to tell their customers that you know we we will deliver in 4 hours or 8 hours or next day or day next to that so that's the kind of uh, planning that they were able to do so as not to leave unsatisfied customers you know, so that's that's what is needed uh, in terms of you know the supply chain planning and that's how the digitalization of supply chains would help or have been helping the customers uh, who have go they really taken a uh, different route really been able to leverage all these relationships have been really able to pivot or create new business models 
the only thing that they've been able to do is to uh, you know leverage on their digital footprint harness on the data that they already had and look at the capabilities that got built because of all this and then decide as to what can be done you know what what should be the marketing strategy what is the consumer buying pattern how do they optimize uh, on transportation how much inventory needs to be kept at what uh, node of the supply chain how do we reduce the safety stocks and stuff like that and and most importantly in these times when the management is not able to meet uh, on daily basis the information is simply available to everybody on their handheld devices or on their laptops you know so management also is able to see uh, the same data available to each of them throughout uh, even when they're sitting at home and take a very informed and conscious decisions as to what needs to be done so that's how i mean they 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 famously now say that uh, uh, gold is new oil <laughs> so so you know the oil made lot of countries uh, rich especially in the countries that uh, country that you sitting uh, they saying that uh, you know that that's the, the new uh, oil is data and that the com- the companies who are able to leverage who able to collect and then leverage and analyze that data would be able to create uh, bigger successes in future uh having said that uh, how do we really go about uh, about uh, digitalization what could be a road map for uh, digitalization i would say that uh, there is no one single answer that fits all but uh, from our own experience what we can uh, definitely say is that uh, these are some of the necessary steps must do or must have uh, steps in your plan when you uh go about digitalization of course uh, one needs to look at the reality uh, of the business what is the current state of digitalization uh, what is the value chain for the particular business and what are the different actors in the value chain you know <clears throat> and that that will give you a sense as to you know how how uh, should you look at the digitalization and how should you go about it at what level are you uh, right now Uh, then of course uh, important to set the ambition uh, from digitalization uh, you know there are all kind of uh, technologies available out there it's important to look at uh, your own business and say okay fine this is my ambition this is these are my objectives and this is how i will prioritize uh, my digitalization uh, journey uh, these are the things that i'll do first and these are the things that i'll do uh, next uh, then of course set up a team we have seen that uh, a lot of companies lot of uh, top level guys uh, entrepreneurs they say that okay fine let's do digitalization okay uh, and then uh, there is no one single team which is responsible and accountable for results you know that's a money going down the drain unless you set up a team make somebody really accountable for uh, for giving you the results uh, this will not happen uh then of course uh, there's the funds the budget that need to be allocated to digitalization uh, uh this brings uh, speed and of course uh, more sense of responsibility in the team because there's a dollar now that is there uh, and 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 that dollar has to bring in the value back uh i would say that lighthouse projects essentially are highly critical you know we must be able to say that these are some of the projects which are the lighthouse projects which will work as a model projects and will create a bigger impact within the organization because people uh, really have to see those benefits early on and to say that yes oh great you know we digitalize this this is bringing in success and that's how they get more motivated these projects really uh, you know uh, really set good examples and people start ro- looking at these uh, pro- successful projects as the models you know for the projects that will be done subsequently and then of course the culture i think very very important part very often neglected you know digitalization uh, adoption to digitalization as a culture is something which needs to have a have a top management priority we if if we don't change the culture within the organization no matter m- how much money have we spent people will not grow uh, used to using uh, the digital technology per se 
you know, so there has to be immense amount of communication around what you're doing internally and externally and then we have to look at how to snowball that culture so that the whole organization becomes uh, digitally adapt you know on what we trying to do so these are some of the components of the roadmap that are must have components uh, which will help you to make uh, your digitalization journey uh, more enjoyable otherwise it can be very painful things can really go wrong uh if some of these things are not done or in fact i would say that uh, yeah yeah there a lot more that needs to be done but these are must have uh, uh components of your roadmap uh yes uh, no matter what we do there would be in challenges to the globalization as we go about it uh, first and foremost uh, that we have seen is that uh, a lot of time uh, management itself pays a uh, lip service to it uh they go about saying that okay yes fine we must do digitalization and then there's no commitment that in, that comes in from so i would say that uh, first and foremost the management has to put their weight behind any digitalization initiative that is being uh, thought of uh, you know they they have to make sure that they consciously uh, consciously put digitalization at the heart at the center of everything that is being done around it A lot of times we have also seen that uh, despite everything being planned, the big projects being envisaged, uh, the vendors lined up. You know, I, we, 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 myself, uh, we ourselves have seen that. Uh, you know, some of our customers started talking to us two years back, and uh, the projects never fructified, despite having excellent uh, discussion uh, and even the, I mean, even the commitment from the management uh, is inertia. you know the organizations just sit tight and they just don't want to move on you know they they pass each day thinking that oh somebody else will come and do it for me or why should i change you know why should i take the initiative so i think uh, events like covid really shake those people out of it you know now we seeing that a lot of those customers who were not talking to us or who were sitting uh, just like that uh, without taking much action have come back to me and you know really started taking uh, really started taking action really are now serious about so i would say that instead of waiting for events like covid to really push us uh, uh, out of inertia uh, the good thing will will be that you know if if as an organization they can quickly decide and say that okay fine we will anyway take this initiative uh, a lot of times we also see that their legacy systems uh, and there's a huge spend that has happened on uh, legacy system or setting up processes uh within the organization huge investments uh, have gone into uh, you know some of the projects maybe setting up a distribution center which is manually managed and things like that so you know we be sometimes are over invested in uh, the current ways of working or the legacy systems uh, which also pose a big challenge uh, to digitalization uh the last one i would say is uh, ecosystem constraints uh, we operate uh, our, each of our organizations uh, operate in a certain ecosystem with uh, many players out there and a uh, lot of times that ecosystem is not mature enough uh, to go for digitalization so we so we, we need to look at our ecosystem and say okay fine uh, are is the ecosystem ready for uh, digitalization because what may happen that if a uh, few of the critical components of ecosystem are not digitally ready then uh, you know your investment may just go waste okay so one option is that okay you decide on the right time to go about digitalization or you then work on the ecosystem to to sort of change the whole ecosystem that's a, that's the approach that uh, let's say amazon has uh, followed globally Uh, or or you know flipkart also in india very successful example for that matter and a lot of other companies are following the the digital uh new age companies they they in fact invest a lot, lot in changing their whole ecosystem uh, that's the approach that they take <clears throat> uh, then within the organization of course uh, the competencies huge uh, present a huge uh, challenge uh, there's less availability of talent uh, you know uh, people who are digitally savvy or the technology guys uh, let's put it simply it guys uh, are not available uh, as much uh, as we would like them to be uh, the the thing with data intelligence is uh, also that uh, uh, you know you need to have uh, data scientists or 
people who can analyze their data and come back to you with the insights coming out of the of the data uh, so that talent uh, is not uh, you know heavily or readily available uh, everywhere and that's where you know, a lot of uh, companies who help uh, customers uh, digitalize uh, come into the picture uh then there are data governance practices uh, we see that uh, data governance is an evolving and emerging subject uh, each country has its own policies each country is coming out with uh, different policies and it's becoming uh, tighter and it is evolving as we speak uh, so that is also important to take care of uh, it should not happen that you go about uh, doing a digital project and uh, you know suddenly realize that uh, you you actually don't own that data so you know one has to keep themselves abreast of uh, what is happening on this front um yes a million dollar question and that what will you get in return if you invest in digitalization uh, there, there are a lot of other things that uh, i could have put but uh, this is purely from supply chain uh, perspective Uh, that if you do supply chain digitalization then uh, what are the benefits that can come to you we've uh, seen that you know there there can be up to 30% reduction in your capital that is locked up in uh, safety stock and uh, inventories we also know that the there can be a reduction of up to 25% in the sales that is lost because of stockouts now this is pure supply chain perspective so uh, you know uh, there is 10% improvement in delivery performance and reliability if your supply chain is digitalized which is huge by the way i mean i think across the board a uh, lot of companies anyway end up achieving let's say 90% order fulfillment rate uh, but you know the digitalized companies uh, go up to 99.9% and that is a huge differentiation every 1% Uh, improvement in delivery performance can mean x dollar coming to your pockets okay uh, of course it it is then related to you know how satisfied is your customer whether they'll come back and buy from you and stuff like that so you know it also helps a lot in uh, customer retention uh, then we see that okay on, on purely on the cost saving basis uh, you know there can be up to 30% reduction in freight cost you can get rid of 10% uh in uh, a reduction in manpower of course if you going for full automation this reduction can be much higher and then we see that uh, there can be a 60% reduction in manual order fulfillment uh, monitoring cost so these I'll are some of the a little fast for some questions also to come just what on to slide okay all right yeah this is my last slide so uh, yep yeah, uh, i i would say that uh, this new digital will make you agile in the new digital world you know and and also to dispel uh, the sort of notion that digitalization is very costly no it is not costly anymore uh, we are not talking about the legacy system where you had to spend let's say several million dollars to get uh, yourself digitalized now the tech solutions the cost of technology has gone down uh, you know very very low i mean we, we can simply relate to the data cost uh, in that sense then there are new models which are not capex heavy they are opex heavy the customizations are very very flexible you can integrate with any system out there you can pay as you go and the payback periods have really gone down to less than 6 months in some cases and yes it is future proof you know you can you can rely on the technology to be there for the next 7 to 10 years at least yeah thank you very much that's all from me uh, thank you thank you both speakers thank you mr Uh, Mr. Vijay, thank you for a very enlightening and inspiring presentation. Uh, let me take a moment to acknowledge both your efforts. Thank you so much. And we move on to the audience Q and A section of this uh, webinar. So let me take the liberty to kick things off. For uh, Mr. Rahul, hmm. uh, you gave a lot of examples of very very quick pivots. So how would you how would you characterize? the uh, the relationships with different stakeholders in your own internal value chain so for example with your you know suppliers with your customers to enable you to pivot that quickly do you think those relationships are the most critical factor for you to you know change something very very quickly from luxury to fashion to let's say essential supplies 
yes so tapan yes relationships uh, are very important of course uh, no doubt about it uh, and 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 this business actually i would say that uh, uh, building uh, building uh, best in class or world class supply chains has hinged a lot on relationships in the past in the brands work very closely with their suppliers to sort of uh, build long term relationships to get the commitments on board what has changed now for for the companies to be able to uh, you know become more agile and responsive uh, in the market that we seeing these days is the digitalization part you know so a lot of companies and and i myself uh, for example worked in ikea uh, uh, several years back and uh, to tell you uh, from my own experiences that we were actually pushing our suppliers to adopt erps you know a lot of suppliers at those times did uh, production planning on the excels or you know looked at their production reports on excel and then that time we clearly went out and told our suppliers that you know if you're doing more than x uh, dollar revenue business with us you must have an erp you know otherwise we're not working with you yeah. and so that's that's where we are i mean we we also seeing that uh, these days uh, and we are a supply chain solutions company and we also provide uh, you know services on the ground we manage supply chains for some of our customers uh, the customers are very clear they they unless you have a wms you have a tms or you have other technology available which helps you to manage your own operations well and can integrate with the customers erp or the customers web shop uh, you know you know just you not even considered uh, the uh, a part of it so you know that's that's the change that we are seeing of course relationships remain important but the relationships now have to be layered with uh, digital readiness uh, i yeah that that makes perfect sense uh, let me take an audience question for i believe uh, mr uh, vijay uh, one of our members mr rajesh agarwal is asked how do you think small traders can follow or implement digitalization Thanks, Mr. Rajesh. Uh, so, I think uh, smaller the size, we have seen one good thing happening is there is much more nimbleness. So, smaller organizations we have seen are far more nimble. Decision making is fast, and as Rahul mentioned, the cost of getting into a digital transformation projects need not be you know scary. Uh, so, the way way to start is to actually have a workshop. wherein one understands the current business model and project in a digitized business model what would be different and what is that value which you are going to extract and i can tell you these projects give very fast roi if you can hit the customer if you can make sure that you are bringing that wow factor to the customer the roi is around to be very attractive but yes it starts first with your assessing your current model and have a assess model projected and have a detailed checklist of what is doable and controllable right right so a small trader might have fewer resources but then they can compete on nimbleness which bigger organizations may not be able to True. may not be able to. sure uh, a question for mr rahul i think so you meant uh, this is from a member mr nishant rathi a retailer who has invested heavily in brick and mortar what should he what he should do with these stores and how he can devise a strategy where both offline and online are complementing each other and probably just to add a supplement this is uh, one of my notes which i made when you were speaking so you you also mentioned that now that lockdown is easing up offline businesses are going back to normal but how much do you think is a permanent behavior shift in buyers and you know sticking to online in in terms of its convenience in terms of its payment ease so how 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 much do you think it's going to be a permanent change versus you know a uh, temporary phase so um, yeah the first part of the question i think uh, the the uh, it's it's i don't see it as a conflict between online and offline i think the retailers even if they are invested heavily uh, in brick and mortar has to look at uh online presence as a sales channel for them to increase their sales and interact with the customer so you know it's it's lot more about bringing the customer at the center of it uh, as vijay said 
okay so it can be a same customer who is now interacting with you uh, online and offline you know so depending upon what their mood is depending upon uh, whether they feel like going out or not you know uh, you have to make yourselves available to the customer you know through a mobile app through a web shop or through a brick and mortar store okay what can be done uh, with these stores is that a lot of these stores can be actually converted into omni channel fulfillment centers okay so if the customer walks into the store you buy from the store if the customer walks into the store and wants you to deliver it at your home that option should be available if the customer orders from home wants to pick from the store that should be available if the customer purely wants to order from home and have it delivered you, you know so so all the omni channel options that you can make available to the customer all the choices that you can make available to the customer is something that needs to be thought of you know so i mean the bigger mindset sh shift has to happen that this is a customer and i must keep it okay uh, and and that's the global uh, way of thinking i mean look at amazon that's what they're doing look at walmart now okay they really caught up big time with the amazon uh, even on online you know so uh, yeah i think there's a lot that can be done around that uh, i i don't see that uh, brick and mortar has to really be in conflict they they have to complement it yeah complement each other sure yeah. uh, another question as a follow up for you what would be the three key areas or kpis that a, a procurement head of a large corporate should focus on today and this is by our member mr ranganathan ramachandran this is for you mr rahul okay so i think uh, i think uh, the number one would uh, uh, so it depends really it has to come out of uh, the organization's uh, strategy uh, as to what do they want to do uh, i would say that uh, okay if, if the company wants to capture the market share uh, aggressively go into the market then i think the fulfillment remains the number one uh, kpi you know that you are able to put your product on shelf or delivered at home uh, as many times as possible so maybe target to achieve 99 plus percent fulfillment rate uh, do not bother too much about the cost uh, the supply chain cost per se varies from 5 to 7% you know uh, so you you may any which way you will vary between that okay so maybe maybe you go up a couple of percentage points uh, if you are if you are a, a cost conscious company bottom line focused then of course uh, the cost remains the number one criteria so how much uh, cheaper can you buy the product from the suppliers which means that you have to work very closely with the suppliers uh, give them maybe commitment on the capacities help them improve their production planning and stuff like that uh, so you know uh to to bring the cost down so uh, it really depends uh, you know and then it then the both the kpis can also be there uh, of course <laughs> yeah. yeah sure uh, a question i think for mr vijay by our member mr melvin cornelio it's a slightly longer one uh, so basically what it means is are we looking at a uh, lot of mnas in the global logistics and supply chain companies uh, given the difficult times currently face yeah from a from a business capacity point of view i think what is important now more and more is agileness and fulfillment distribution companies are no longer using terminologies like distribution which is more product oriented people are more using fulfillment as the terminology which is more customer centric mnd is of course in times like these when cash is certainly at a, going to be at a huge premium one can expect consolidation in industry but one will also be sure that the earlier ways of huge capexes are no longer going to be in fashion so optimized capex capex turnaround how do you use technology to have a multiplier effect of what you physically own is going to be the way so yes we can expect consolidation for sure but yes the ones who are digitally more agile or have a mindset or have certain team uniqueness would be probably be much better place to capitalize on this right right uh, so a question to both of you and maybe i'm just trying to be the you know contrarian for a minute and let's say uh, let's say i want to believe that you know everything that's happening right now it's a temporary phase right it will probably things will probably revert to normal in the next 
12 months, 18 months. And I don't want to change anything. I want to continue doing business the way I was doing the, you know, in 2015, according to your cartoon. So what is the probability that I am right? Number one. And number two, what are the biggest risks for my business with my belief, with my current belief? What two or three major, major risks my business is facing if I continue to you know, think this way? Rahul, start. Yeah, okay. So uh, I think we famously using this term that we are uh, living in a VUCA world, you know, <laughs> which is, uh, which is highly volatile, uncertain. We just don't know what is going to happen. Okay. So uh, COVID, I mean, I, I don't think uh, sitting in, uh, even in, even in January, nobody believed that it would hit us so hard. You know? So I would say that, uh, yes, uh, that's one factor where we just don't know what is coming and what will happen at one point of time. And we, we seeing a lot of supply chain disruptions happening across the world. I mean, forget COVID, but even before COVID, the cyclones, their floods, you know, there are other disruptions that are happening across the world when it comes to supply chain. So that's one thing that we got to look at. Even if we say or believe that my business is uh, not impacted by all those things, uh, the world around us is definitely changing. You know, we are uh, the, so see, even before COVID, for example, digitalization as a trend had picked up. You know, it's been happening for uh, last three, four years. Uh, so, so uh, you know, a lot of companies are investing in it. So, of course, the ground below our feet is shifting. You know, it's changing. Uh, then. Uh, we can be very specific to a business case. We may just think that, okay, some of the businesses uh, will not get impacted. Uh, the niche businesses like, uh, let's say, adventure sports. You know, you may create, uh, let's say, a very nice video game for you to get a touch and feel of it. And now uh, we even have uh, new technologies coming like virtual reality or augmented reality, which can give you that, that same feel. But you know, this there would be still customers who would go out and want to have some fun. You know, so wild, wild, wild wadi uh, water park is not going out of the business. I think the moment COVID opens, the kids would force their parents to take them there. You know, so some of those businesses would remain uh, there. We are not saying that uh, everything is. Uh, I think interestingly, a little philosophically, also if we look at it, world is going to two extremes now. You know, there's on one hand there's everything which will become digitally driven technology centric and COVID somehow is also forcing us to relook and go a little primitive, you know, <laughs> working at home, staying at home, being with the family, you know, going back to older ways of uh, entertaining us. So yeah, I mean, it, it's very uh, specific to one's business, but uh, yes, of course, if you are in, uh, let's say running a supply chain oriented business, uh, then I think, uh, uh, the world around us is changing. It's very fast. Yeah, fast changing, yeah. <laughs> Vijay, you want to add, add something? Or? Yeah, I, uh, broadly, I think uh, that this change, what we are going to see is just an accelerator. It is not going to probably reverse something, but digitalization, which had started in 2015 and not noticed by many, are now going to get many new customers, consumers, and believers. Uh, so, yeah. yes, so I'm more on the camp that uh, we will see this as a launching pad for a faster rate of digitalization. Sure. Uh, just, uh, just to wind down the Q&A session, a couple of last minute questions from our members. Uh, I think this is for Mr. Rahul. Could you suggest a WMS solution and what budget is required? I think we can neglect the second part because, <laughs> but would you suggest any solutions? WMS solutions. Well, uh, not in this forum, of course, <laughs> but yeah, there are a lot of WMS uh, solutions out there. Uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, I mean, depends really on the scale of your operation uh, yeah. and, and what you're doing. If, if you, what I would say is that when you going to select a WMS, yes, have a look at your operation and what exactly do you want to do? Uh, per se as a business study, if you are going online or if, and if you want to have B2B and B2C presence, then make sure that you go for a WMS, which can handle both because there are w, a lot of WMSs out there who are, which, which can do only B2B and there are a lot of other WMSs, which can only do B2C. Okay. But very few out there who can do both. Okay. So I would say, look for those, uh, if you're going multi-channel, omni-channel. Okay. 
if you have huge scale of operations, yes, you have to look at the WMS, which is more robust uh, and can handle a huge amount of data and complexity. If you have simpler operations, maybe you can uh, go for a, a very light versions available out there in the market for few dollars per month uh, kind of a, uh, kind of expenses, you know. So it really depends, you know. And no, uh, it, that's why it's important to sort of look at the business uh, and then say, okay, fine, this is what uh, you should go for. Yeah. And and just to wind down the last question uh, from Mr. Abindakshan. Uh, basically, what he is asking is, if there is an online channel and an offline channel, should there be a difference in pricing strategy if you want the online offline customers to continue to you know utilize that channel? especially if that offline channel is B2B customers. So do you think there should be a pricing differential? Should that be a strategy to have a pricing differential on online and offline? So I think uh, the, the good way to look at it is that what is the landed cost you know, or, or landed price for a customer? Okay. So if let's say a customer is walking into your store, and you're not delivering, then there's certain uh, element of cost uh, that disappears. Okay, but then you have a retail cost per se, the, the rental or whatever you're paying for that. And then on the other hand, if you're delivering at home, there are different cost elements that come in the picture. Okay, I would say that uh, it really depends what kind of brand you want to create. Uh, it has to be largely driven by uh, your business strategy, your branding strategy. Uh, if you want to have a uniform uh, pricing across the channel, I I would say that end, ends up creating a more uh, credibility uh, in the brand and maybe uh, may convert into the cu customer loyalty for the brand that you're getting it on the same price. The the challenge also remains that uh, you know the different channels end up uh, <laughs> end up having their own negotiations uh, with the brand and uh, you know may may put up different prices uh, on different channels. Uh, so yes, uh, it also depends on the strength of the brand. We have seen that some of the brands are able to command that kind of positioning uh, because simply because uh, they have some very loyal customer base, a very strong brands in the market. Uh, then, you know, they, they, they manage to have the uniform pricing across different channels. So, uh, yeah, uh, not a very straight uh, answer. Uh, depends on the strategy again. Yeah. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this brings bring us to the conclusion of the Q&A session. Uh, on behalf of IBPC, I would like to thank both our speakers today, Mr. Vijay and Mr. Rahul. This has been an absolute treat and a true learning experience for all of us. Uh, thank you both. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm it sure. It was a pleasure yeah. to be here. And thanks, thanks IBPC for giving us this opportunity. Sure. Uh, sure Thank you, everyone, for taking out time. And uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I'm sure everybody is more busier than they were ever working from home. <laughs> That's what I feel. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. you know, I'm sure that the knowledge and the action points you've shared they are going to be truly beneficial for all the attendees and all our members. Uh, hope so. you, let me also thank the attendees for being with us we have 15 minutes over time but you know the presentation and the entire webinar was very engaging so thank you all thank you for your questions thank you for your participation and i hope you know the session was productive and it makes you feel inspired to move forward with a different direction within your organization i would also like to take a moment to acknowledge the people behind the scenes to organize this webinar this event was hosted by the infrastructure logistics shipping and transportation focus group of IBPC and IBPC as always is all, always grateful to the platinum sponsors. Lulu Group International, Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum City District 1 and Bank of Baroda. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the conclusion of this event. Thank you all for being with us again. Thank you. Wish you all a good day. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you. Yeah.